Everybody and welcome to another board game breakfast. My name is Tom Vassal. I'm your host. This is a show that's all about board games and the people who play them. Well, as always, we have a lot of content for you. Um, normally, I do a Q&A on Mondays, but I'm going to be pushing the Q&A back to later this week. So you'll probably see it Wednesday. We might even do two Q&As this week. Um, uh, we just got back from the Portal Gaming event up in Manchester, Connecticut. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the show, but for those of you who did come by and say hello there, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And other than that, I think it's time to get started. Let's first talk about the news. Okay, so the news has kind of died down some. We're getting closer to Essen, so you'll probably see more news as the weeks go by. AEG has announced an expansion coming in October for Mystic Veil called Veil of Magic. That's not a very original name. Uh, this is going to add more cards and some new things maybe? I'm not really sure. I just know that it adds more of the two different types of cards. So, well, well I'm, the game really is like looking for an expansion, so I'm excited about that. This game is a gorgeous game looking game. This is Hop. This is from Fun Forge and Passport about... Uh, flying, it has painted miniatures, the artwork is done by one of the artists who worked on Dixit, and this game just, I don't know, this is the kind of game if I saw it on the shelf I'd be like, I want to get that one. Hasbro has announced Simon Says Vader. Uh, this is here for no reason at all. I. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Renegade, now this is interesting, they're releasing a pack called Santa's Renegades. This is a pile of promos that you can get if you buy one of their games from a store. So the different stores that they buy enough Renegade products will be getting several of these. And so if you go buy a Renegade pro uh, product, you will get a pack of these promo items. It's a very interesting idea. I, I don't know how popular it will be because you get all these promos for all their games, but hey, it's a good selling point. So let's say you buy Lanterns. You get the pack of promos, you get a promo for Lanterns, you're like, oh, there's also a promo in here for uh, Clash. Maybe I should get Clash, so we'll see. But it's still neat to have promos, and they're supporting the local gaming stores. Z, uh, the Stronghold has announced La Grania No Siesta, which is not an expansion for La Grania. It, this is basically a dice game that is the, using the same, some of the same mechanisms. There's dice used in La Grania, so we'll see how the, this game, is it a simplified version? We'll find out more. I think it's coming out of Essen. Z-Man has announced Micro Robots, which is a smaller version of Ricochet Robots. It comes with a translucent robot, which has me interested. I'm like, oh, that's cool to see a robot you can see through. Fragger Games. Every year at Essen, Fragger Games releases a small print run of a game, usually 1,000 or somewhere around 1,000. And each year, their games have been getting progressively more grandiose till last year, the, they had a mountain of, that it was made of ceramic inside the box. The box was so big that for if, if you were going to carry it back in a suitcase, it would pretty much take up half or more of your suitcase. Um, so their games are all over the board on how good they are, but now they have announced that they are not going to have one at this year's Essen, which is the first in a decade, I think. Uh, and instead, they're going to be showing off a game at Essen, but this game is going to go to Kickstarter. So Fragger Games is going to Kickstarter, and it's a licensed game, but... I don't know, license could mean anything. Ultra Pro has acquired Playroom Entertainment. Now, Playroom Entertainment is probably best known for their Killer Bunnies franchise. They have three different games about Killer Bunnies with a cabillion expansions. They also have a lot of really great children's games and just, you know, some good family games. They have a pretty big catalog and they got some party games and such. This is interesting to me. Why is Ultra Pro acquiring companies? Ultra Pro has already... Uh, picked up uh, the exclusivity for Stoneblade Entertainment. They have Jolly Roger games, Table Topics, which is like cards you put on a table and you can read them, and now it's all talk about this topic, which sounds extremely fascinating. But these are like companies that are like all over the place. It's not, there's like not any kind of, they're not like hot companies. Jolly Rogers is not a hot company for sure. 
Uh, Player Entertainment is more so, although they lean more towards almost mass market with their stuff. Ascension is certainly a hot game from Stoneblade Entertainment. Um, table topics I never heard of until I read this press release. So I don't know. Why is Ultra Pro getting all these companies? Ultra Pro is like a company that makes sleeves. We'll see. I'll try to talk to them more at the next convention where they're at. Well, anyhow, that is the regular board gaming news. Let's take a look at the Kickstarter news. <laughs> Happy breakfast, everybody! Summer is coming to a tiny epic close, so let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Gameland Games is kickstarting Tiny Epic Galaxies Beyond the Black, which features new content and mechanisms for Tiny Epic Galaxies. This dice and card game, in which players leverage dice rolls to explore planets, well, it now has pilots. These special characters get unique ships and have individual special abilities to help you because now you can also discover resources and life forms while dealing with black holes and supernovas. Collecting these new elements let players earn badges that are worth endgame points. On top of all of this, there's also a bunch of new planets and secret missions to add to the game. In keeping with the tiny epic line, Beyond the Black has great components and tons of content in a small box. If you don't own the base game already, you can add it on, but if you already have it, you can get a copy of the Tiny Epic Expansion for a pledge of $24 plus shipping. In Cake Duel, you lead a team of hungry sheepy who are trying to steal cake from each other. This is a two-player bluffing game, and for such a cute game, it's pretty cutthroat. All cards are played face down as players use archers, soldier, and wizard sheepy to steal opponent's cake, but the opponent can use defenders or scientist sheepy to defend. Either player could be bluffing about what they've played, so you can just accept the attack and defense claims and resolve the cake theft, or you can challenge, and if you challenge and are correct, you get a victory point, and if you're wrong, your opponent gets the VP. A few random special sheepy are added to the deck that enable special abilities, and mix up the gameplay a bit. And of course, Cake Duel is in maximum overdrive cute. Even the box is adorable. You can get a copy of this bluffing duel game for a pledge of $20. Stop the Germs is a two-player tile laying game that literally fits into a pill bottle. Players have the same 10 germ tiles that are worth 1 to 6 points, and a few random special germ tiles that get shuffled in, adding scoring bonuses and special powers. In a turn, players either place, flip, or move a tile, and this super quick game ends when all the tiles are played. Scores based on how many germs you have facing up and whatever special abilities you landed. This is a cool little filler for travel gaming on the go, even though the TSA may look at you askew. You can get a copy of Stop the Germs for a pledge of $19. Outlawed is the latest small box treat from Green Couch Games. In this bluffing game, players are recruits trying to help Sheriff Croc Holiday capture Bandit Bluffs outlaws. Players have synchronous decks, play cards face down, claim a bandit, and then reveal. If an outlaw's apprehend condition is met, it's captured and thrown in jail. Of course, players can tell the truth about the card they've played, but it can also be a lie. Outlawed features a cast of anthropomorphic outlaws, quick gameplay, and you can get a copy for a pledge of just $15. And last but not least, Chimera Station is coming from Tasty Minstrel Games, and this one is a doozy. In this game, you'll be the manager of a space station construction effort. This is a worker placement game with the massive twist that you get to splice together the most efficient workers, adding brains, claws, leaves, and tentacles. These components are incredibly charming and clever. But beyond the customizable workers, Chimera Station has a deep worker placement game too that has you gathering materials, money, and new components. You can buy board modules that add new game actions and give you victory points. And there are perk cards that add unique abilities, bonus points, and other benefits, including action spaces that only you can use. On top of all of that, there's a research track that you can advance to add workers and abilities. A copy of Chimera Station takes a pledge of $45, but as with previous campaigns from Tasty Minstrel, the Kickstarter is the chance to pick up the $60 deluxe version, which includes some snazzy custom metal coins and unique stretch goals. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. 
Hello my friends, I'm Professor Hans von Puppet. Today we'll be taking a look at a Euro-inspired area enclosure worker placement bluffing game, which is heavy on downtime, but still gateway-ish and simple. Hello. Oh, hi there. Yeah, I was just busy gambling stuff. Today we'll be dis dis discussing gambling, or as I like to call it, admitting you have an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> Push your luck or press your luck games. In these games, you have something and you have the option to gain more. Even though you have enough, you can still get more. There is a penalty though. If you stumble or fail, you lose everything. I love it. <laughs> the prime example of this is uh, Ink and Gold. There are many games that use this mechanism, but this has the most easy one maybe. So, let's delve into this one and see what it's all about. In Ink and Gold, you are going through a temple collecting treasures. So this is not how the game works now, but let's say, just for the sake of argument, I go in here, and I can take 9 money now, and leave. Or, I can push on, and get more. Oh, look here, 13, great. I can even push further. Oh, oh, a cave-in. Well, the first cave-in is safe, so I can still leave now with a lot of money, or I can continue, like so. Oh, okay, more money! I can still continue. Yeah, of course I'm gonna continue. Oh, 2 of the same disaster, I'm out. I lost everything. So how far are you willing to push it? Well, there are many games to test your skill in that. You have Deep Sea Adventure, Port Royal, Celestia, Ink and Gold, and even, even Past the Pigs is a great example for this. I love this game, actually. So many different games use this method in so many different ways, and I love how you can be pushed, and the only opponent you have is yourself at often times. So push your luck or press your luck is to see how far you're willing to go, or gamble with what you have, and see if you can gain more and more and more, and stop at just the right time to get the most out of the, your journey. Okay, thanks for now. Hey folks, I'm Tom Basil. Jason Levine. Today our question is from Bob. And Bob says, if you buy a game, let's say Puerto Rico or one of these games that has an insert, and you buy it used from someone else, and it doesn't come with that original insert, would that bother you? Yes, 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 yes. That happened to me recently. <laughs> And what you bought a game from somebody? I was at uh, an auction at um, WBC, and I bought a copy of Princess of Florence because I needed the insert because my insert broke. And I bought the game, and then I opened the box, and there was no insert, and my face just deflated. Um, okay, but you bought that box for the insert? Yes, because my insert broke. But couldn't you like like inspect it before you bought it? No, because it's like an auction. You can't go up and say, "I want to inspect stuff." <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've seen that happen at auctions, remember? I know. May, well, yeah, at certain auctions, like Gen Con, they let you <laughs> walk up and expect things. Um, but no, I, I love inserts. I love inserts with games. And to me, an insert is part of the game. So if you're buying a used game, I really want the insert. I guess I would be, you know, let's just mix this up with everything. Let's say they, they sleeved the cards or didn't, you know, or they took out components, put their own in. It's kind of a buyer beware situation. When you're buying something used, you gotta know what you're getting into. So that's a time where I'd ask questions. What is this missing? Like if you get a used game from me, um, you're probably gonna get everything in it, but if it's off my shelves, maybe, it may, the insert might not be in it. I might've taken it out because it annoyed me or whatever. And there were times I got rid of inserts because I was bringing them back in suitcases from mm. Germany or whatever. Oh. And if you want the insert, I can't fault you for that. But again, I think that's a communication thing, really. Yeah, I mean, realistically, you know, what Tom does with his games is he takes all the expansions and everything and piles it in one box, so you lose the insert at that point. But, you know, there's plenty of companies where you can go and buy an insert that you could fit things in if you really need an insert and the game doesn't have one. But usually when I am doing that, piling everything in one box, I'm hanging on to the game anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, buyer beware is, I guess, the, the, the story there. Um, but maybe, you know, again, I'm not certainly criticized. If you want that insert, that's fine. Um, just I, that's something I would check upon. All right. I'm Tom Basil. Jason Levine. Welcome, friends. I'm your Whitleypedia, the free board game encyclopedia. Now, sharp-eyed viewers will notice the large pile of boxes behind me. That is because after several years here in Northern Virginia, your Wikipedia is moving, not just moving down the street, but overseas to the United Arab Emirates. That's right. I'm going to live in Dubai for the next year. It will be a new chapter of adventure and excitement, but it might be terrible for board gaming. 
See, I've developed not just one, but several groups of friends to play games with. And I fear when I leave, I'll be going not just literally, but figuratively into the desert as far as games are concerned. Now, I know what you're going to say to me. Jared, the UAE is a first world country. They have more money than they know what to do with. They have the world's tallest building. They have an indoor ski slope. They have Vin Diesel. They can they get whatever they want. Certainly, they're going to be able to find the resources to play a couple board games, right? And yes, they do, and things might not actually be that bad. For example, I found this article in the UAE newspaper, The National, and uh, let's see what they say here. <clears throat> I could check out T-Junction, where, quote, wordsmiths test their wits and speed on Scrabble boards, and a current addition to the mix is Jenga. All right, okay, well... Next one is Indulgence Cafe, where I could request a game of Ludo, Monopoly, Taboo, or Pictionary. Sounds like a rager. Okay, here we go. Third time's the charm. At Burt's Cafe, I can find the world's largest crossword puzzle and copies of Trivial Pursuit that, quote, beg to be played. Whew. Okay, well, friends, I'm going to be in Dubai for a year. Hopefully it won't interrupt my board game breakfast schedule too much, although I know it will. I don't want to be able to do every week from here on out. Maybe every other week, maybe every three weeks, I don't know. But if you're interested in playing games with me while I'm in the desert, maybe we should try Tarji on Board Game Arena. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. In this episode, I happen to stumble across a really fun adventure type card game, a little bit of a set collection and rolling dice called Dragonwood by Game Right Games. Super fun, I couldn't believe how fun this was. It's a very simplified version of an adventure game. But it also opened up the opportunity to create a Pokemon Go game. So I took Dragonwood and turned it into Pokewood. Let me show you what I did. Dragonwood is a Rummy style game where adventurers will try to collect cards of the same uh, color, the same number, or the same adventure. And each of these cards, you're able to have a strike, you can stomp, or you can scream. And that's when you have to roll the dice. But to see how many dice you have, it depends on how many cards you get to play. In Pokewood, everything's the same, except I change out the name, and the, I put the graphics of the Pokemon in here instead, and I put the Pokeballs here, but they pretty much represent the exact same thing. But next week, I'm going to introduce how to use the Pokeballs in a different way after going to a Pokestop. The only thing I didn't do is I didn't put trainers here yet. I'm still using the, the, the regular adventure cards that came with it, but next week I will have trainer cards instead with their colors doing the same mechanic. Dragonwood is a perfect example of a simple game with a fun theme that you change out to Pokemon Go, and now you have a theme where you are trying to catch Pokemon instead of slay dragons. Next week, I'm going to take this to the next level. I'm going to introduce new components, and I'm going to introduce a Pokestop and show you how we can make that mechanic work with this game. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. We'll see you next time. Hey, welcome to the 101. Now, I know last week I said I'd start some tanks, but I had somebody come down from I Connecticut. Know. And that's my grandson Hudson. So this week we're going to show off some of the work that everybody has done. And as you can see, because the little kitty is sticking her tail in, it's really been pretty busy. So we're going to take a look at everybody's work that they've done over the last month and all the wonderful pictures that you sent me. And next week we'll come back with the Sherman tanks. What do you think about that? Okay. We'll say hi. <laughs> Let's go take a look at those pictures.
you go. That's it for this week. It wasn't that cool. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good too. Why don't you say goodbye to everybody? And next week we'll be working on some Sherman tanks. What do you think of that? Say bye. Bye, no rhino. You don't want to go? No rhino. He likes rhinos a lot. We'll see you next week on the 101. Okay, so we have many reviews coming out this week. There's a really big review coming out today. I still can't talk about it. It clears at, it's around 2 o'clock, uh, 2.30 Eastern Standard Time. You'll see a review. It's a Miami Dice review. But we also have, I'll be taking a look at Corrupted Kingdoms, Masters of Orion, the board game, Allegiance, You Gotta Be Kidding Me, and a few other games as time goes by. Uh, me and Jason are going to be taking a look at Haspel, Haspelnecht, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I'll be taking a look at Blank White Dice. Um, so, yeah, several games coming in that regard. We're also going to be talking about our top 10 games we're good at. Sounds like a very egotistical list, doesn't it? It was one you asked us to do. So we'll see how that goes. We did it live at Portal. Um, and then some other stuff coming out this week. There's a board, uh, no, no, a Throat Punch launch coming out on Wednesday. And, of course, all the different podcasts and the Dice Tower Network. And you can find all that stuff at Dicetower.com. Hello, Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, continuing the conversation that we started last time about errors in board game packaging and documentation, the impact it can have on the user experience, and what, if anything, can be done to prevent these types of issues from happening in the first place. Well, last time we took a look at several typographical and grammatical errors that found their way into several recent games, which inevitably raised the question, so what? Every form of entertainment makes mistakes. Movies have continuity errors, comics are continually retconned, and skywriting is consistently illegible. So, what makes board games so special? Well, the reason why I believe errors and inconsistencies have a greater impact on the enjoyment and usability of board games as opposed to other forms of entertainment has to do with just how much damage our brains can deal with. For example, forms of passive storytelling entertainment, such as movies, books, and comics, take advantage of the fact that your brain is wired to fill in the gaps in the storytelling. That's why scene changes, chapter breaks, and spaces between comic panels work. In each one of these transitions, your brain is able to logically deduce what information is missing and fill in those gaps on its own, creating a continuity to the experience. Your brain is constantly stitching together these separate fragments to create comprehensive narratives, whether that fragmentation is intentional, as in the case of scene changes, or accidental, as in the case of a continuity error. Ah, but unlike those other entertainment mediums, board game players are active participants in the narrative that a board game tells. If there's an error in a game's rules or documentation, it disrupts that narrative far greater because the player's brain is not just observing, it is participating, controlling the player's journey through the story. Try skipping a chapter in a DVD that you're watching. You can probably still follow the story, even though your brain has to assume, oh, hey, wait a minute, there, there's something here that happened that I missed. Well, I'll just kind of logically fill in the gaps. But try skipping a page in a game's rulebook, and you likely won't be able to play the game because your brain won't be able to devise a substitute for the missing information that works well enough to allow you to participate in its narrative. So, if these types of errors are so detrimental to the enjoyability, even usability, of a board game product, then why do they keep happening? Well, well, next time, we'll discuss the most common causes of board game design errors and see if there's any way to prevent them from ever happening again. Hi everyone, and welcome to another segment of Board Gaming with Colleagues with To Die For Games. I'm Mandy, the Board Gaming Pinup Girl. I'm Tracy, the Gaming Maven. Where's Stefan, the Games Teacher? 
Sorry, sorry, I'm Steph, the game's teacher. Sorry guys, I was busy finalizing my travel plans to Las Vegas. Yeah, you're, you're late. Sorry. Okay, so I guess we'll start over and we'll play this game during... Lunchtime! Lunchtime. <laughs> so today we're taking a look at the game Las Vegas, which was created by Rudiger Dorn and published by Ravensburger Game. It plays in about 30 minutes and it plays two to five players. Basically, over four rounds, you're going to be rolling dice to get the most money at the different casinos. On their turn, each player will roll all of the remaining dice and then select a value of die and place all of those die values on the matching casino. At the Once all the players have placed all of the dice, the, each casino is resolved and the player with the majority of that casino wins those prizes. I thought this was a great game to play during lunch. I mean, there's a lot of dice rolling, so it's obviously, you know, luck, luck, luck. I'm a terrible dice roller, but I still had fun. What did you guys think? It's funny, because when Stefan bought this game, I was like, oh, casino <laughs> game? And I was like, I played it, I was like, oh my god, this is, this is amazing. I got to play it uh, when a friend brought a copy out to one of our games nights, and then I looked for it for a while and couldn't find it until we found it used at a flea market, so. Oh, fantastic. See, I'm a big Lords of Vegas fan, but that's not a game that's really good to play at lunchtime, so this will, you know, wet your whistle if you're looking for a casino-themed kind of game. Mm -hmm. So, overall, I think we enjoyed it. Oh, yes. All right, so that's it for now. You better get back to Las Vegas-style playing, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Card drafting is actually kind of a weird mechanism, especially for inexperienced gamers, but Sushi Go's simplicity made the mechanism really accessible for gamers of all levels. Well, Lummox Labs has just released the app version of the game for iOS, sorry, Android and Windows. So let's take a quick look at this pick and pass app. In the ultra adorable Sushi Go, players are trying to collect different delectables, each of which scored differently. You pick a sushi to keep and then pass your hand to the next player. This continues until the hand is empty and you see if you are clever and lucky enough to collect the highest scoring meal. Lummox Labs' approach to Sushi Go takes away the card visualization, but it keeps the cuteness and even adds to it a bit. The sushi swings by on a conveyor belt hosted by an octopus chef. You have easy visibility to what your opponents are accumulating, and the UI is really intuitive. SushiGo has a good interactive tutorial that you must play through once to open up the game. The rules in Sushi Guide are also available in-app, which is a feature I appreciate. You can play against the AI, which is pretty easy, and there is online play through Game Center, but there's no pass and play feature at this time. Heads up that some players are reporting difficulty connecting to online games while others seem to have no problem. Definitely make sure your OS is up to date because online play is what makes this app super fun. As a solo game, it's a super light filler on the go and it's a great app for kids. SushiGo is a delightful implementation that plays great on a phone or tablet screen. I like the design choices Lummox Lab made and if you're looking for that light and charming gaming experience, this is worth a look. Hey folks, today I want to talk about what I call super fans. Now I find super fans to be kind of a fascinating phenomenon and I think they can be both a benefit to a publisher and a danger to a publisher. A super fan is somebody, I, I call them super fans, but I, I guess there's no official terms, but it's somebody who I find they take a game, they fall in love with that game. They know all the ins and outs. They're very active on forums about that game. If you say oh, something about this game, they know the you know they know all sorts of things about it. And then there are many games that are uh, that I call um, that 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 kind of bring this out of people. But I think no, the ones that come out this the most are often a Marathrash games. Games where there's all sorts of characters and this, and these are the people who rank the characters involved in the game, or the different factions, like Summoner Wars, it would ha definitely has its super fans. Magic the Gathering, uh, you know, any kind of ca tactical card combat game. And the benefits of having these super fans is when you have this game, you go to a convention as a publisher, these people are willing to demo the game for you. They're going to go out and they're going to promote this game to everyone they know. This game is could maybe be a lifestyle game for them, something that they really enjoy. And so when it comes time to uh, design more for the game or upgrade the game, the super fans are there asking to the help, willing to give input. 
And this is where I think the danger to a publisher lies with superfans. See, a, 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 a fan of the game, someone who really loves the game, they are going to go into this when you say, what should we add to the game? And they're going into it from the aspect of someone who is familiar with the ins and outs of that game and knows it backwards and forwards and knows what we call the meta game really well. And because of that, the, the company, if they listen to these super fans, they will make the expansions of the game so, uh, so much so that they only really work for people who get into the game exceedingly. Like you'll look at a card and go, what is this card for? And some will say, oh, well, there's this deck that people make that does this, 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 and this, and that card is there kind of to stop it. And you go, oh, oh, oh okay. And, and, and for the fan of the game, that is amazing. But what happens is not power creep per se, but um, complicated creep. I, I don't know what the word for that would be, where each expansion for the game requires you to really have a good grasp of the game. Sometimes this doesn't just happen with expansions, but it happens with uh, a redoing of the game or a second edition of the game, and you listen to the, the, these super fans, and they say, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, and the second edition, rather than being a better streamlined version of the game, can be more complex. Now, this doesn't happen very often, but it is something I noticed. First time I, I, I really caught a glimpse of this was Quest for the Dragon Lords. Quest for the Dragon Lords was a very you know, go out and, you know, it was like a Risk-style game with plastic miniatures, but you also could take some of your people and go out on quests, and then you would find a Dragon Lord, and you would go out and fight. And I enjoyed the game a lot. With the retrospect of 10-plus years, I now look at it and go, yeah, okay, it wasn't that great of a game, but it was fun, and I had a great time playing it. And so the designer said, oh, Tom, you like the game? And he found other people who really liked the game, and he started getting input from us, on what do you want to see? I'm going to make a second edition of this game and expansions. And I would say, oh, well, you know, the, the, I really like this game, so let's try to streamline it. Let's, let's make this game accessible to everybody. And several of the other people said, no, 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 no. Uh, we need to do this, this, and this. And the designer listened to the people who wanted more complexity and wanted more of what was in the game. And so, for example, some of these people said, we really want pewter miniatures because we want to paint these miniatures. We don't want this plastic stuff. So the second edition of Quest for the Dragon Lords came out with pewter miniatures. Well, pewter miniatures work really good for people who are into miniature games. Most people who play board games do not want to put miniatures together. They definitely don't want to paint them because when you have a bunch of pewter miniatures on the board, you really cannot tell them apart. So they almost have to be painted when they're small. And they also didn't want all this complexity. It added more complexity to the game. And the game, frankly, did not do that well. The same thing happened with a game I love. Duel of Ages. Now, I'll admit, I am a super fan of Duel of Ages. Uh, when Duel of Ages first came out, they were looking for more characters. I was designing characters right and left for the game. I love the game. There's a lot going on into it. When I heard they were making a second edition, I was very excited. And you know what? I love the second edition. It, there's so much cool things in it. But you know what? I can hardly play the second edition. Because the second edition is more complex than the first one. Now, people who play the game will tell you, no, it's not more complex because they did this and this and this. No, it is more complex. From someone who, I love the game, and I can understand everything in the game, but for people who are new to the game, the, the rule book was really huge, and you had to go, you had to like walk through several tutorials to learn it. They added more stats. Each character had like 10 stats. Now there's like 15 stats per character. Uh, there's different decks of cards. And, it did not make the game that easy to play with new players. Now, perhaps the designer of Duel of Ages did not care about that. Then maybe they just were making kind of like a love letter to the fans of the game. And fans of Duel of Ages 1 came on board. I was one of them. I liked the game. But a lot of me wishes and says, why, well, as much as I like the game, I wish they had made it more accessible to everybody. And I feel like this can happen sometimes. There's, uh, I was playing a game the other day, and there was a card in the game, and I was like, why is this card here? And someone said, well, that's to stop this card, you know, this, this deck that people were making. And I said, okay, that's, that's well and good, but without that insider fan knowledge, this card seemed like garbage to me. It didn't make any sense. Or sometimes you have expansions come out for a game, and you get them, and you're like, this, this isn't even really that fun. Well, yeah, but the cards in it were made for the metagame, and so that, 
You know, Mage Wars has certainly fallen prey to this and other games where, uh, like, a, the Mage Wars is actually the game I'm talking about where there was a couple cards in it that were made to stop uberly strong decks that people were using in tournament play. And some of the decisions that the Mage Wars team has made are based on the very loud vocal fans of the game. And if you're going to listen to loud and vocal fans, that's fine. I don't think you should try to tick off your fan base. But at the same time, if you're listening to the people who know your game in and out, those people don't necessarily know the target audience in general, and they will sometimes pick something that they personally like, but will not help sell the game. And almost in all these circumstances where I've seen the super fans get really involved and the designer and publisher say, come on board, help us. And then they, let, they almost take over the project and run it, and then the game just kind of dies out because it becomes too complex and it becomes to a point where only a very few people, they still love that game and it's still a great game, but try to teach someone new and it's just not worth it. Duel of Ages is one of my favorite games. It's my, one of my daughter's favorite games. We like playing with each other. But I hardly ever teach it to anybody new because it's so complex. And I sit there every time and think, wow, I love to see a nicer, faster, streamlined version of this. So I don't know, just something interesting. If you are a publisher, uh, or maybe you are someone who works with a publisher who certainly listens to fans, how do you keep the game from going too far in a direction where it's all about what the fans want, these diehard fans, as opposed to what's really good and will help sell the game. And now you're only selling 500 copies because these diehard fans, so they're like, yeah, we got exactly what we wanted. But it hurts the game overall. Or maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe you should listen to the fans. Tell me in the comments below. Hi, guys. All kids are back in school. And if you want to hear me sing a board game song about it, I suggest you check out Board Game Blender's back to school episode. Turkish kids are having a rough start of the school year. You have probably heard about that failed coup in Turkey last July. The Turkish president Erdogan believes that the mastermind behind this coup is the Turkish preacher Fethullah Gulen. All over Europe there are schools that follow the beliefs of this man and parents fear that if their kids are attending those Gulen schools they will get in trouble with the Turkish government. So 20% of the kids attending those schools did not show up at school start. This week I am playing a kids game, a hidden gem that I found in Essen last year. This week I am playing La Chasse au Gigamon. In La Chasse au Gigamon, or just Gigamons players play a variant of memory. There is a 3x3 three three grid of small monsters called Elamons. You flip over two and if they match you collect them and you get to do a bonus action. Sometimes you get to go again depending on which ones you matched and sometimes you get to swap out one of your collected tiles with somebody else's. If you have three Elements that are the same, you get to invoke the big brother, the Gigamon. The first player who receives three of those Gigamons wins the game. Quick and simple and a little bit more action compared to memory. Gigamon. My name is Dave Luza. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. My name is Niels, so let's Brettspiele, and today we are talking about Besieged from Cool Mini or not? By far, my favorite thing on Besieged is that it looks so cool and it has such a great feeling when all these hordes coming and trying to uh, attack your castle, your keep in the middle, and your six up to six heroes try to defend it. What an awesome moment! And talking about worst thing on this game, we are going a little bit back to mechanics. In this case, when you are playing with six characters and each character has exactly three actions, you have three, nine, 18 actions in total. There are variants, if, for an example, you are simply playing with four people, you are taking two characters out. And now, for the exact same amount of monsters running to your keep, you have instead of 18 possible actions each turn to finish the monsters off, only 12. And the same level of um, danger, the same level of monsters coming into, there's no adjacent to the number of players on the board. And that is horrible. That was my personal favorite and worst thing of 
besieged from cool mini or not. My name is Neil Zürich, Brettspiele, and see you next time. Bye bye. This past week, we had a chance to go to the Portal Game Store. They brought us up to Manchester, Connecticut, uh, where we were able to go to a, a small gaming event at their store. Now, the Portal Game Store is kind of a break off from the Time Machine Toy Store. Time Machine Toy Store used to have gaming in its basement. That gaming has basically moved out to the Portal Game Store. But I do want to talk briefly about the Time Machine Toy Store because this store was amazing. First of all, I thought their selection of games. They had Time Machine Store, which are games like for the general public, um, the games that you know would be competing against those that you find at Toys R Us and such. I thought that they were very, they had a great selection of games, really. I mean, there was over a hundred different games easily, kids games and party games and, and family games. It was a really good selection, but the store itself was amazing. It was just a toy store. It's in an old soap factory, and when we went through, it was just like, wow, you know, very high-end expensive toys, too easily cheap toys that you can buy. A whole section on dollhouses, a whole section for RCA, um, for racing, and what was the most phenomenal part to me, on the second floor of this building, they had a lot of different hobby trains for sale, but they had this gigantic, and I mean really big, train layout uh, with model trains, and once a week, uh, a local club comes in, and I'm surprised at the store. The store is so very generous to let them do this, and they have this huge display, and people come in and watch them run these trains. And I've been to like model train places before uh, where they have them all set up. And I've seen big setups and I've seen bigger ones than at the store. But this one was pretty big. I was very impressed by this. And so that this whole store, as I would just go through and say, oh, here's a section with kites. And here's a section with, uh, you know, outdoor toys. And here's this section. And it was just a really neat toy store. And if, I had, if that was it, I would have been impressed. But the portal itself is a really nice, wide open, well lit gaming store. There's a very heavy emphasis on Warhammer 40K. There's a lot of that there. They have a room in the back where there is uh, displays. They have lots of terrain. And we actually co-opted that room while we were there. And that was kind of a room where we did special events like our top 10 list or a game show. Uh, but they also have a lot of open area. They have a very big library. I would say they have at least three, four, 500 games in that library. And they're pretty quality games, and they're constantly adding those games. And the people who run the store are very nice. They they uh, they know a lot about games, all of them. Uh, but they're also very professional. It was interesting to watch as they ran that store. They ran that store very well. So the store itself was pretty cool. And when we were there, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we met lots of people from Connecticut, although people came from all over uh, the nearby area, from New England, from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. So if you came, again, I wanted to say thank you for saying hi to us. Uh, we showed up on Thursday. We played some games till midnight-ish or so. Then Friday we came in. We recorded a podcast. We, um, we did a live top 10. Like I said, the top 10 games we're good at, which was kind of more tongue-in-cheek than anything else, but it was pretty fun. Uh, we then played some more games, and then at night we did a Wits and Wager show, and then we played more games. We came back in Saturday, and we played our favorite games, each one of us, and uh, so mine was Cosmic Encounter. I played an eight-player game of Cosmic Encounter, which was a spectacular good game. I really thought I had it in the bag. I was millimeters from winning. And, well, I did not. <laughs> but it was an incredibly good game. Everyone there was really good. I mean, overall, I had, a, I had a hot weekend, though. I mean, I was winning lots of games. I had good rolling on dice. So uh, but I got to teach Feast, for, Feast, uh, Feast of Odin. Feast for Odin, sorry. I got to teach that several times. I was able to play Automania. I played um, uh, Airlines Europe. Just... It was a really relaxing, cool time. Ate at a cool restaurant called Cosmic Omelette, which should be like the, the mascot of... I've been played Cosmic Encounter. So anyhow, thank you to the Portal Game Stores for bringing us up. Thank you to everybody who came and said hi to us and played games with us. It was a really cool, kind of laid-back event, and we had a fantastic time. Hi. My name's Dave Adams, welcome to Good Game, Better Gamers. My friend Ricky and I are about to head out to Brisbane Comic Con. We're presenting a couple of panels there, we're very excited. But before we go, I'm gonna share with you the next two games in my 10x10 challenge, in which we I'm playing 10 games, 10 times, and trying to learn a little bit about my gameplay, game style, and me as a gamer on the way. First up is 
one that I've talked about many times before, and possibly because it's in clearly in my top five of favorite games of all times, and that's Ghost Stories. Now, of course, this was going to be on the list. It was always going to be on the list. Destiny decided long ago that this game would be on the list. Now, Ghost Stories, as many of you would already be aware, you play a Taoist monk. It's one to four players, which is brilliant because as I'm trying to play it 10 times, I don't need people around to play it. I can play it single, which means that every loss is entirely on me. Last time I spoke about this, I was talking about the fact that I failed a lot at this game. And it's been quite a while since I spoke about that. And I'm pleased to say that I've been consistent and continue to fail at that game. So I don't want to let you down. I'm going to keep playing this game until one day, in time, I will eventually win. Next up is Pathfinder the Adventure Card Game. Comes from one of my favorite designers, Mike Selinker, just simply because of the, the way he incorporates story and game mechanics. He's a great designer. Uh, Pathfinder Adventure Card Game came out of his work on Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder the RPG. It's essentially an RPG in a box that doesn't need a DM, so you can get up and you can play it, again, single player, which is brilliant for me, or you get people around and you've got character sheets, you've got characters that grow and change over time, but it's all through mechanics of cards and how they play out. It's a, it's a wonderful introductory sort of gateway game into role playing, as well as just being a fun game for people who like board games. So it works on both sides of the spectrum for me. Well, that's all from me. Thanks for watching. Next time I'll bring the last three of the games that uh, are on my 10 by 10 challenge. Until then, enjoy your breakfast. Hello, my name's Dan and this is Cora. And we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of around five and under. And today we're gonna to talk about this game. What's this game called, Cora? We call it the worm game. We call it the worm game because we're not quite sure what this means. Da ist der Worm drin. It's a German game. Let's see how it plays. In Da ist der Worm drin, you play a worm, racing to get to the top of a compost heap. The players take it in turns to roll a dice, which tells them what size segments they can add to their worm to push it towards the finish line. For most of the time, the progress of the worms is hidden, and so there's a nice little side game where you bet on whose worm will pop up at various points first. It's a very simple game, and one that we're probably going to outgrow pretty soon, I think. However, it's one we've been playing since Core was around two and a half, so we've certainly got our money's worth out of it. Now, this is one of Cora's favourite games, mainly because her favourite food is worms, and so she likes eating them. It's not worms! Oh, sorry, it's, it's, not, it's not worms, apparently. Um, she, likes, no. she likes eating bugs instead. No! <laughs> I, I love mashed potato and gravy! Mashed potato and gravy! Sorry, I get them mixed up, they're very easy to confuse. So, Cora, do you like this game? Yeah. What do you like about it? I like the betting. You like the betting? And what else do you like about it? Um, I like two wins on it, and I like the time when I win. <laughs> you like the time when you win? I like, I like it when I win, too. Yeah. So, a very good game, lovely artwork. It's a roll and move game, but you know, sometimes you have to put up with roll and move games, I'm afraid, when you're playing with four year olds. And um, we really like it, so I'm giving it two thumbs up. Hey! Hey, everybody! That's it now for Board Game Breakfast. I want to thank once again all my contributors for the amazing job that they do week in and week out. And so um, we're always looking for feedback. And if you like what they do, mention it in the comments because I know they read the comments and they love to hear from you guys. Um, well, thank you to everybody who's involved. Like I said, we're going to be doing a Q&A sometime this week, but I'm not sure exactly when. But we've got lots of videos coming your way. And I did not mention, but I should, my top 100 of all time is starting this week. So well, I'll be putting out two of those per week, so about five weeks. Have my, have my top 100 changed? Well, let's find out. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast on The Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.